I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who has contacted me since the last lecture. And if you'd like to um, do that, I'm very happy to respond online. Um, you can contact me via my website, the address for which has just appeared on the cathedral um, in the picture. And um, just as uh, Dana says, these lectures are based on my book, Night in the Darkness, um, which uh, was described, I was very flattered uh, by uh, Gemma Simmons as offering powerful perspectives on the new normal. So last week, as Dan said, I looked at the whole business of the whole Christian understanding of truth. And uh, I just recap on that. Very <coughs> One of the things I said was that we are living in a time of judgment. And I describe this as God holding up a mirror in which we can see more clearly how things are here on earth from his perspective. I said that the crisis that we face uh, through COVID and indeed through the uh, climate change is basically a spiritual crisis. And what is needed is to transform our spirituality. And I explained a little bit about that. I then talked about what I described as the culture of untruth. And in the course of this, I said there were two levels of truth. There's what you, you might call empirical truth. And then there is a deeper truth, which we see embodied in Jesus and which stood before him, uh, which stood before Pontius Pilate when Jesus was on trial. I said that truth is a journey and not a destination. And as the true and living way, Jesus calls us on a journey in which these two levels of truth, the empirical and the deeper truth, uh, are explored together. I believe that we can see signs of that happening in our response to the cry of the earth. And I ended by saying that we needed to pursue wisdom because in uh, E.F. Schumacher's words, we have become too clever to be able to survive without it. And so to today, the second lecture of the Bread of Life, enabling justice and generosity to shape economics and society. We are reminded almost daily of how the pandemic is showing up the basic inequalities in our society. And also between the so-called developed countries and the rest usually referred to, I think somewhat patronizingly as the developing world. One of the things that faces us clearly in God's mirror is the extent of injustice in our own nation and in the world economic order. And God is reminding us, I believe, of the imperative of justice. Arranging things in a way that is fair and just is one of the most basic responsibilities of anybody in authority, from parents to government. The imperative of justice has a particular urgency in today's world, as the gap between the rich and the poor gets wider and wider. Indeed, in the face of gross economic inequality, it is not only the desperately poor, but any who have a moral sense who feel the injustice at the heart of modern life. Because our life is not founded on truth, we have lost our way. Justice is fundamental to human society. But down the centuries, philosophers from Plato to John Rawls have differed about what it entails. The Bible has a distinctive view, a powerful perspective for the new normal. Providing justice is a basic function of law. The law given to Moses on Sinai, and you can see a picture of Mount Sinai on your screen. The law given to Moses on Sinai was designed to shape the nature of Israelite society. And this is equally the role of law today. 
Justice is more than settling disputes fairly according to law. It is a quality of the laws themselves, ensuring that everyone is protected, able to participate in the society, and that at least their basic needs are met. Justice must be enthroned in the laws themselves. Justice, in this more developed sense of social justice, was basic to Israel's self-understanding. And this marked Israel out from the other nations of the ancient Near East. The Ten Commandments and the other laws that Moses received at Mount Sinai set out the terms of the covenant between God and Israel with the object of establishing a righteous society where everyone was dealt with fairly. The Christian view of justice is rooted in this notion of a righteous society. One of the things that Jesus teaches us is that righteousness and justice will not be established without self-giving, even to the point of self-sacrifice. And this fundamental truth is the subject of the first of the I am sayings. I am the bread of life. Justice depends not simply on the structures and systems that we, that we create, but more fundamentally on the kind of people that we are and the values that motivate us. The law given to Moses was based on the economics of generosity. For example, it imposed upon the rich a duty of generosity towards the poor, not the kind of generosity that we associate with charitable donations, but a sacrificial sharing of wealth and goods. The way we deal with, our, deal with our wealth and goods is the subject of economics, and economic ideas bear powerfully on our hope for justice. St. Paul warned against letting the greed that makes an idol of gain take root in our hearts. And in an interesting passage in his letter to the Colossians, he brackets together promiscuity and profiteering. Put to death, he wrote, those parts of you which belong to the earth, fornication, indecency, lust, foul cravings, and the ruthless greed, which is nothing less than idolatry. Today's economic culture encourages precisely the worship of the idol of gain, Imp implicitly legitimizing greed and avarice and marginal marginalizing any idea of self-giving. The single-minded pursuit of self-interest has become normalized. For the few, this may seem like the way of hope. For the multitudes, it is the way of despair. Just as Jesus offered himself as the true and living way, so he offers himself as the living bread given for the life of the world. The new normal must be shaped by the virtue of self-giving, following the examples of doctors, nurses, carers, and other key workers, so that the economics of self-interest give way to the economics of generosity. These key workers remind us that financial rewards are not the only incentive nor indeed the most important incentive. In the new normal, we need a revaluation of vocation and of the ideal of public service. At Mount Sinai, Moses received the Ten Commandments, the foundation of the law of the covenant. As the journey continued, God gave him further laws and commandments. It is an impressive code covering all aspects of life, worship and community life, land and property, trade and personal conduct, in all well over 600 commandments. These laws are set out in the books of Numbers and Leviticus, which I know is not everybody's bedtime reading, but they are a rewarding study 
if they're read from the perspective of the kind of society they are designed to create. This, of course, is not to say that the actual conditions of life for the Israelites in the sort of desert landscape that you see before you, um, this is not to say that the conditions of life of the Israelites offer any kind of ideal, nor indeed do many of the rules, like an eye for an eye, for example. It is the hope of a just society enshrined in the law that speaks to us, a hope which is characterized by the concept of shalom. Justice, in the biblical understanding, must serve shalom. The Hebrew word shalom is usually translated as peace, but the concept is actually much richer, especially if peace is regarded simply as the absence of conflict. <coughs> Shalom goes much deeper. Bishop John Taylor explains shalom is the harmony of a caring community informed at every point by its awareness of God. It speaks of a wholeness that is complete because every aspect and every corner of ordinary life is included. And those two words, harmony and wholeness, are, I think, the key to understanding the concept. We might think of shalom as the love of God shaping a community, like the monastery you see before you. Bishop Simon Phipps was asked once what love meant in business life. He replied, taking everybody's interests seriously. And that is what Shalom seeks to do. Taking everybody's interests seriously means equating the interests of the rich and the powerful, the movers and the shakers, with the interests of the moved and the shaken, the poor, the powerless and the dispossessed. To this end, the law placed upon the king a special concern for those on the edge of society often described as the poor, orphans, widows, and strangers. They were no less deserving of justice than the rich. And when a new king was enthroned, the liturgy included this prayer. God, endow the king with your justice, that he may govern your people rightly. May he give judgment for the oppressed among the people. May he crush the oppressor. Consistent with this, at harvest time, the law decreed that when you reap the harvest in your land, do not reap right up to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your crop. Do not completely strip your vineyard or pick up the fallen grapes. Leave them for the poor and the alien. Clearly, concern for the poor takes precedence over profit maximization. <coughs> <coughs> the imperative of justice is a constant theme of the prophets. Amos thundered against the hard heartedness of the rich. Listen to God's word, you cows of Bashan on the hill of Samaria who oppress the helpless and grind down the poor, who say to your lords, bring us drink. He wasn't, of course, addressing cattle. <coughs> <coughs> the image that he used to describe the rich was in fact a breed of very well fed and uh, good looking cows, which apparently uh, were on the hills of Bashan. These sorts of sentiments would have seemed extraordinary to other ancient cultures, where the personal arbitrary rule of the king prevailed, and where power, strength, and wealth were equated with right. It challenges many conventional attitudes today, among them the aggregating approach of the modern economy. 
God's preferential option for the poor does not fit with the utilitarian ethic of the greatest good of the greatest number. The poor are <coughs> <coughs> tend to lose out. The most radical example of this was the law of the Jubilee, which reset the economy every seven years when debts were remitted and slaves were freed. While this wouldn't work today, if it ever did, what does speak to us is the principle of restructuring the economy in a way that takes everybody's interests seriously. If a society is to be just, the laws have to be applied according to their spirit and not simply according to their letter. In other words, the rules have to be applied with morality and righteousness, which are prior to law. The law gives shape to society, but it can be a dry thing. The spirit gives it life, as an oasis brings life to the dry desert. The French jurist Montesquieu was one of the first to point out that justice required more than applying the dry letter of the law. For him, the administration of law should be governed by virtue. Those who make the laws, accepting that they are also subject to them, which implies a willingness to put the interests of the community ahead of purely private interests. Montesquieu said, when virtue is banished, ambition invades the minds of those who are disposed to receive it, and avarice invades the whole community. This is precisely what we saw, for example, in the banking crisis, in the abuse of parliamentary expenses by many MPs, in the subprime mortgage scandal, and in the way multinationals avoid paying a fair share of tax. Most serious of all, we see it in the way democracy is subverted through what has been described as the erosion of norms. The way the unspoken rules and conventions that transcend political differences and ensure that power will be exercised according to accepted standards are ignored. We saw this with Donald Trump. We see it with Vladimir Putin and with other authoritarian leaders. And I'm sorry to say that we see it too in the refusal of Boris Johnson to sack ministers who have been independently judged to have breached the ministerial code, preferring his own judgment. Jesus said he came not to abolish the law, but to complete it. And he did this by going beyond the letter of the law emphasizing its spirit, placing intention above rule and substance above form. He bitterly criticized the Pharisees who stressed the letter of the law over the spirit. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithes of mint and dill and cumin, but you have overlooked the weighty demands of the law, justice, mercy, and good faith. It is these you should have practiced without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain off a midge, yet gulp down a camel. We really need to take this to heart. In the wake of many crises, when individual, corporate or political behavior has been found wanting, we routinely hear the defense, we have done nothing wrong. A mantra repeated time and again by those whose selfishness was exposed in the Paradise Papers, for example. Judged by the letter of the law, these protests may be correct, though not always. But judged by the spirit of the law, the weightier demands of justice, mercy and good faith, it most certainly is not. Laws, codes of ethics, and rules of professional practice are insufficient in themselves to prevent injustice and corruption. 
their purpose will only be achieved when the right spirit is brought to their implementation. Given the scale of the problem, one could be forgiven one could be forgiven for assuming that corporate codes of ethics are more about presenting the right image than actually governing behavior. Generally, we do not need to tighten up the laws. For example, I believe the rules and the regulatory regime were both strong enough to have prevented the banking crisis. It was not so much the law that was inadequate, but the people who applied it. Both bankers and regulators were too much concerned with the letter of the law rather than its spirit, with maximizing profit rather than pursuing justice. Part of the problem is that corporate codes of ethics cannot reflect the true nature of ethics, namely a form of self-obligation rooted in truth, by which we, uh, which we uh, autonomously impose upon ourselves. As justice is a function of the law and of the spirit, so it is also a function of leadership. A fundamental issue facing all leaders is to whom and to what values they are accountable. Democratic systems are generally understood as offering the answer that the leaders are accountable to the people, to those who elect them. But we cannot be content with that as the whole answer, if justice is to be upheld. As the truth stood before Pilate, so it stands before all rulers, demanding a more basic accountability. The pandemic has put leaders in the spotlight and is showing the inadequacy of certain leadership styles, particularly, particularly those based on personal power and charisma where, as we saw with Donald Trump, loyalty to the leader displaces loyalty to the law and to the truth. From a Christian perspective, leadership is a thing of the spirit, an, in an insight shared by others. For example, Professor Joanne Siula of the Rutgers Business School in the USA. She wrote that leadership is not a person or a position. It is a complex moral relationship between people based on trust, obligation, commitment, emotion, and a shared vision of the good. This is, if you like, a modern take on the kind of leadership that we see in Jesus. With him, the moral imperatives of mercy and compassion, essential elements of justice, came before law and judgment. Above all, Jesus shows how the leader must bear the burdens of those whom he or she leads. This is the servant model of leadership. When the disciples were quarreling among themselves about who was the greatest, he rebuked them. Unlike kings, he said, who lorded over their subjects, they must bear themselves like the least among them. The one who rules must be like the one who serves. When Jesus washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper, he acted out his words. I am among you as one who serves. As Archbishop Justin Welby has said, when the one to whom all power was given knelt down to wash feet, God reversed the world order. If we look for justice in the new normal, then this is the kind of leadership that is required, but it's in short supply. The personal journey that it requires is too challenging. But I believe most of today's problems can be traced to bad or inadequate leadership. <coughs> All too often, those who lead us turn out to be either self-serving with little concern for justice 
accountable, if at all, to their supporters, or so concerned to retain popularity that justice is sacrificed to expediency. <coughs> Servant leadership and the concern for justice has been an important aspect of the church's witnesses, of the church's witness. From the first deacons to saints like Basil in the fourth century, William Wilberforce in the 19th, and Oscar Romero in the 20th. Those who work to provide education and health care for all, to improve housing and working conditions, to bring an end to hunger and deprivation, who campaign for the remission of the unpayable debts of the poorest nations, and for effective measures to combat human trafficking and climate change, are all, I believe, working towards shalom. As Archbishop Justin Welby said, they are enthroning Christ over mammon, whether they know it or not. Alongside these acts of service, the church has also developed a body of social teaching that applies the Christian understanding of justice across a wide spectrum of social problems, <coughs> including economic issues. At its heart is the insistence on what is called the universal destination of material goods, based on the vision in Genesis that God intended the earth and all it contains for the use of every human being and every people. Most recently, <clears throat> Pope Francis, writing of God's special concern for the poor, has given a timely reminder that property has a social function and that the private ownership of goods is justified by the need to protect and increase them so that they can better serve the common good. It doesn't need me to point out that this understanding poses fundamental challenges to the economic assumptions that face the contemporary world, to which I now turn. In the first lecture, I described the dominant spiri spirituality today as an economic spirituality. Economic ideas are so pervasive that as the economist Jane Co Collier pointed out, we live in an economic culture. The language of economics is the language through which the world is understood. The language by which human and social problems are defined and by which solutions to those problems are expressed. Political options translate into economic decisions. Political decisions are implemented by economic institutions. We have lived so long in a world dominated by economic ideas that we have taken them on board as the warp and weft of life, just as medieval Europe accepted Christianity. Indeed, economic ideas function just like a religion, providing the basic understanding of what life is about. I glimpsed an alternative when I visited Ethiopia in 2019 and experienced a non-commercial Christmas. People celebrated by making a pilgrimage to their local shrine, like this one here in Lalibela on the picture before you. They celebrated, as I say, by making a pilgrimage to their local shrine, not by indulging in an orgy of spending and overconsumption. Jane Collier wrote in 1992, when the change in economic policy that began in the 1970s had taken full effect. The Keynesian approach to economic management gave way to a new approach called monetarism gave way is actually too weak a, a way to describe the change. 
it was a deliberate political choice. As Margaret Thatcher made clear in an interview for the Sunday Times in 1981, she said, economics are the method, the object is to change the heart and the soul. In other words, the change in this economic policy was uh, the object of this change to bring uh, of this, the object of this change in economic policy was to bring about a profound spiritual change. The effect has been to make economic considerations and market outcomes paramount in shaping both society and morality. Though from the perspective of justice, it ought to be the other way around. Social structures are more basic than economic structures. Life is more than getting and spending. Monetarism was founded on a different analysis of the way the economy worked to that of <coughs> John Maynard Keynes. But what is significant is that that analysis was the brainchild of econ economists whose political preferences were for a limited economic role for the state and who believed in the autonomy of market forces. The leading monetarist, Milton Friedman, believed that economics should be seen as an objective science, in principle, independent of any particular ethical position or normative judgment. However, economics cannot be acquainted, it cannot be equated with objective sciences like physics, because the data on which it relies, namely human preferences, are subjective. Monetarism, like Keynesianism, and indeed all economic theories, is a creed, not a science, a creed that deprives us of one of our uniquely human qualities, the ability to step back from our situation <clears throat> and decide both the values that are important to us and the goals we wish to pursue. When the only objective truth is determined by the market, all other values are no more than mere dreams and opinions. The fundamental role of the law given on Sinai, <clears throat> namely shaping a just and participative society, is denied. The only choice allowed to us is the choice of what to consume. The subordination of the social to the economic is also connected with the conception of justice developed by the philosopher John Rawls. Rawls was one of the towering figures of moral and political philosophy of the 20th century. And his major work, A Theory of Justice, was heralded by many as a new dawn. Although Rawls conceived justice as fairness, he did not regard social outcomes, that is the actual conditions of life, as the basic criterion of whether an economic or political system is just, as in a society based on shalom. Instead, Rawls regarded as fundamental the nature of the institutions of government. <clears throat> if the institutions are just, by which he meant that they are agreed on unanimously by all through some form of social contract. And the outcomes they produce must be accepted as just. His theory has been widely criticized, notably by the economist Amartya Sen, for not paying sufficient regard to outcomes. As Sen says, Concern about the actual conditions of life and how they can be improved is a constant and inescapable part of justice. Although Rawls' theory is by no means accepted by all economists, many still believe that the market is an inherently just institution and thus its outcomes must be accepted as just. In my view, this is nonsense. There is nothing new about markets. There have been markets for as long as there have been people. 
in no better way than the market economy has been found for distributing scarce resources and for lifting people out of poverty. But this does not mean that we have to endow market outcomes with a divine inerrancy. The market is a human institution, and like any other human institution, it works to the advantage of those best placed to operate it, namely those with economic power. It may be the best mechanism for production, distribution and exchange, but the market does not of itself have any concern for the justice of the outcomes. And we see the injustice of market outcomes in the disparity of provision in housing, education, healthcare, and employment, and now indeed in the incidence of disease between affluent and less well-off areas. We also see it in the lowering of ethical and moral standards, not only in the conduct of business, but also in civil society. You cannot roll back regulation without implicitly legitimizing a more relaxed business ethic. And because morality is all of a piece, that relaxation spills over into other aspects of personal behavior. The heart and the soul have indeed changed. However, like all inst human institutions, the market operates within the legal and moral framework. And this is where our grounds of hope lie. Christians are not alone in believing that the new normal, that in the new normal, the market must be contained by a solid moral regulatory framework, like the solid rock which surrounds St. George's and the other churches in Lalibela. Adam Smith, one of the founding fathers of modern economics, whose ideas are regarded with something approaching biblical authority, believed that the market could be justified only in terms of individual virtue. And he warned that a society governed by nothing but transactional self-interest was no society at all. Market fundamentalists, who repeat endlessly Smith's words about the invisible hand, which converts, they believe, a private gain into general prosperity, need to take to heart his view that markets depend for their effective operation on a string of moral virtues, not least honesty and trust, virtues that markets themselves cannot create or sustain. Divorced from virtue, the market for all the good it produces becomes our master and not our servant. And this underlies the feelings of alienation and powerlessness that are widespread today. The pandemic, the ecological crisis and climate change, as well as human need, press on us the need to restructure the economy so that everybody's interests are taken seriously. This is by no means to be anti-business. As Pope Francis has said, business is a noble vocation, providing that those engaged in it see themselves as challenged by a greater meaning in life. The same could be said of public and political service. And it is where that challenge is absent that the seeds of injustice find fertile soil. Some of you may have listened to Mark Carney's Ruth lectures last year, in which he said that human values must replace market values if we are to reverse the dominance of the economic over the social, the expedient over the ethical. A significant step would be to require companies to operate not just in the interests of their shareholders, but of all their stakeholders, employees, suppliers, customers, and the local community, for example. Significantly, the World Economic Forum in Davos last year 
endorsed a statement issued by the chief executives of almost 200 large corporations in the USA, precisely to this effect. The outcome of the struggle that is going on right now to regulate social media effectively will be an important sign of whether this statement has teeth. Even if it has, there are some deeper questions that we need to address. In our economic culture, increasing material prosperity and ever expanding choice are the way to happiness. Individual wants are central, ethics are utilitarian, and it is assumed that human behavior is motivated solely by the rational pursuit of self-interest. Love, altruism, and charity, which have no price, have no economic value. This economic view is far removed from the Christian view, which sees love, not consumption, as the primary motivation in life. Placing service above self-interest, equating love of neighbor with love of self, insisting both that the common good is central and that the condition of the poorest, rather than the general level of material prosperity, is the bottom line in determining the state of the nation. Perhaps the most basic question we need to ask ourselves as we shape the new normal is this. Do we see ourselves as consumers defined by our appetites or as God's children defined by our hopes? Defining ourselves by our appetites and the economic imperative of material growth have created a culture of overconsumption, a major cause of global injustice. In 1975, Bishop John Taylor published Enough is Enough, a prophetic Christian critique of the consumer culture. He described the poison in the system as excess, a lust for possession and domination. We see excess not only in personal consumption, but also in corporate strategies, like using, the mar like using market power to impose unfair terms of trade and maximizing profits and shareholder value as though they are the only valid bottom line, ignoring the more fundamental bottom lines of the people and the planet. Echoing John Taylor, Rowan Williams has said that we need persistently to ask the awkward question of what we need growth for. What model of well being do we actually assume in our economics? As he says, without an answer to that question, we just perpetuate the virtual reality atmosphere that created the financial disaster of recent years. I am the bread of life, given for the life of the world. The Lord who gave the law gives himself. With arms outstretched, he teaches us that it is self-giving that leads to life. Self-giving that fulfills the law and undergirds justice. Every time we break the bread of life, we enter into the movement of his self-offering, asking that his will be done, his kingdom come on earth as in heaven. The bread of life was broken for the many, not for the few. Restraining excess extends beyond personal behavior to the way in which the economic system is operated. We hope for justice, not for charity for laws and an economic system that will reflect the values of the law given at Sinai and be administered in the spirit of the new law given by Christ so that everyone's interests are taken seriously and the economics of injustice give way to the economics of generosity. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Peter, for that uh, really wide ranging um, exploration of uh, justice and particularly in relation to um, the markets and economics. Uh, a huge amounts to think about there, especially at the moment, I, speak, I guess, where the state has just, um, uh, you know, taken on all sorts of responsibilities, which we haven't seen it um, uh, used for many, many years, really, um, in peacetime, certainly. So it's an uh, interesting time to be considering all these, all these questions. Um, if you, uh, I generally encourage people to put questions in the chat box at the bottom, but if that's tricky, uh, do unmute yourself and um, ask Peter a question uh, directly. Ah, it's Bruce. Quite a few people. Peter, can you hear me? I can. Hello, it's Richard. You will remember me, hopefully, from St. Mark's. Um, Do I remember Richard? Yes. Where were you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Hello. I'm Richard, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is my first time. I haven't been, uh, I've never used this chat facility. And that's, uh, I, I put my hand up on that. So um, if, I, if I may, I'll, I'll just uh, talk to you uh, um, normally. That last bit, for me, you know, very wide ranging um, uh, indeed, and so many issues. And I'll really confine myself to uh, hopefully one basic question. I mean, the big thing that came to me was right at the end when you quoted Rowan Williams and reminded us all of his question, what do we need growth for? Now, you didn't go on to answer it, and that would be another few lectures. Um, but I mean, basically, the implicit question is, I think he's asking, could we not, could or should we not be content with a simpler, more frugal life? Um, and uh, the, I, I would agree with him. Um, but I think the, the real answer to that is yes, if we were all true Christians. But we're not. We live in a society where we are in a in a minority. Um, and really, I, I questioned the utopia that you were um, referring to earlier when you, especially when you talked about those people visiting the shrine at Christmas. Um, and I think you said, um, as opposed to indulging in an orgy of spending and consumption. And I just ask you, um, do not feel that that spending is needed by businesses, particularly in the private sector, to actually pay their employees, contribute to their pensions, and pay taxes to the exchequer, which go hopefully in the way we spent in the way we would want as Christians, uh, because there are already worries that after this pandemic, people will have lost the spending habit and will keep their money in their pocket and will not go out and spend and all these private sector businesses will suffer. So that's my question. Are you not being a tad unrealistic with that comment? Well, that's an interesting one. <laughs> <clears throat> um, what I would say is that um, I've noticed recently there's been quite a lot of emphasis by people who would not regard, you know, not speaking on behalf of the church or not speaking as Christians, on the need, in fact, for people to moderate their appetites. I mean, I just remember recently there was something on the news about the need, for example, to eat less beef and, and you know, and other things of this sort. So the question of moderating appetites, of reducing our demands on the earth, are actually <clears throat> quite important. Rowan Williams' question, which is where you began, um, I think is designed to prompt a debate in society about really where we think we're going. And that, and the pan, and he wrote some years ago, the pandemic has really sort of shown up the, the, um, the urgency of that question. And it is by no means just Christians who are concerned about this. How we work this out, 
how we ensure that you know enough wealth is generated in order to support the poor and to provide income and so on as, as you say that is the sort of question that people like <coughs> excuse me people like mark carney are addressing and which um you know he gave an indication in his wreath lectures as to how that might be done it's a challenge for economists and i think part of my job and the jobs of people like me is to actually just to keep the question there um and it's for those with the expertise to um struggle with this we're setting an agenda yeah, thanks peter um there's uh, two questions here which might sort of relate to each other so i'm going to ask both um what this one from melvin saying how do christians counter the claims of false prophets to be the saviors of those who feel alienated and forgotten in today's society um i think referring to perhaps to mr trump there and his uh, uh uh, sort of salvation uh, complex, uh, saviour complex, um, but also uh, sort of the mirror side of that, Jane Bartlett's asking, uh, are there, what, who are the positive uh, models of servant leaders in our world at the moment? Who, who might be our inspirations and um, give us some sort of, <laughs> some more hopeful uh, question perhaps uh, for, us, for us to ponder? Thank you. I mean, th these are really excellent questions. Um, uh, <clears throat> as far as Jane is, uh, Jane's question, I mean, I think that's something I would just like to think about. Um, I, I think what I said in the lecture was, it is, it's some of these key workers, in fact, all of the key workers that we need to look at. There are people, um, there are people in who come up regularly on the news, who we read about in, in various ways, who just say, I do it because this is who I am. Um, and one of the things that I need, to, I think we need to do in order to provide a better quality of political leadership and I don't think it matters whether you look whether you put yourself on the right or the left. It's not particularly impressive at the present moment either way. Um, we need to say, look, you need to model yourself on these other people. And when we see leaders that are not modeling themselves on the servant, we need to we need in whatever situation we have to try and point that out. I mean, I mentioned last week that I write occasionally to the MP and I, amongst other things, I have pointed that sort of thing out. Um, Boris Johnson has sort of changed his attitude recently. He's a bit less sort of bouncing around. I don't ascribe that to the letter I wrote, but you know, it just shows you how the pressure which comes from people um, change and, and situations changes things. How do we counter the claims of false prophets? We can only counter the claims of false prophets by telling the truth. And if you if you read the the old prophets in the Bible, you can see what a struggle that is. I mean, right now at Matins, we're reading through Jeremiah. Um, and he's a very good example of a man who told the truth to those who were engaging in false prophecy. Uh, it's it's a hard road, but I I personally don't see any other way. Um, yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, questions. Fran Fran Jones asks if the Grenfell Inquiry in the Texas energy crisis confirmed that we're going backwards in terms of justice for those in need. I would say yes, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Right. Sorry. No, that's that's fine. That's fine. I was just going to follow on with that question. Um, are there any other questions people would like to, to ask, uh, perhaps using the microphone uh, to Peter? I suppose and I was thinking about Jane's question and um, 
I, I did actually think of the Queen um, as someone who kind of models um, a certain sort of servant leadership. Um, and I guess that's sort of built into the, you referred to um, the Old Testament's vision of kingship, which of course is sort of built into the coronation uh, oaths of the Queen herself. Um, but um, uh, which has sort of come up against uh, that sort of celebrity culture a bit, hasn't it, this week in the discussion of uh, Harry and Meghan and what does service look like? Service is universal, was there was their comments um but i suppose that that might be a question about um which ties into what you just said about um social media but also the kind of pr celebrity culture um how, do, how does that affect our search for a just society again it comes back i think to telling the truth um i one of the questions i was asked last week by eileen about her son who gets all his news from social media. Is that Eileen down there? No, I can't see her on the screen. Um, I mean, that really re remained with me. And I, I've thought about that most days since last, last Thursday. And I mean, it, it, just, it just shows the, the, the huge mountain we have before us, rather like that picture of Sinai, which I showed at the beginning. Um, all you can do is to patiently tell the truth and ask the questions, you know, where will this get you if, for, for example, all you do is to pursue your own self-interest? Um, there is, of course, I think, a deeper need and uh, to understand the sense of insecurity and frustration which comes in the modern world. And I think um, a lot of us just feel completely powerless. And the sort of questions which are being asked just reflect this sense of powerlessness where we feel ourselves to be in the grip of forces which are too great for us. But we've been here before. Um, and I take a certain amount of encouragement from people like William Wilberforce who campaigned against the slave trade, for those who campaigned for the remission of the unpayable debts of the world's poorest nations um, as the last uh, millennium came to a close. And, and you see, it's <clears throat> and gr gradually it is moral pressure which produces change. And the more I feel we can we can be part of that and the church is well placed to embody that moral pressure the more we can embody that and imply it the more the things will change but one thing i was going to say to eileen and is that what we're trying to change are what are called the heavy structures of society and turning around anything heavy is a huge problem I mean, some years ago we visited Norway and I saw a, an oil tanker moored in a field. And the thing, it was the biggest ship I have ever seen. I think it took us almost, you know, two minutes to drive along its length. Um, and we weren't hanging around. And I thought, well, now turning something like that round takes an awful lot of time. And it's the same with turning around the values that motivate modern life. It's not going to happen quickly, but it will happen if the pressure is applied. Um, I mean, I, I'm actually quite, I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. That's a, probably a good place to, to end, not least as the, the dog appears and <laughs> announces, uh, announces that he needs a walk. Um, but uh, no, that, thank you very much, Peter, for, uh, as, again, a really uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture, which I think, especially as we think about society after the pandemic, um, it brings all sorts of things into, uh, into focus for us. Um, and interesting, you know, beautifully relating to your last lecture too, so it's a lovely... Um, uh, flow to it all. Thank you so much. Next week, um, Peter is going to speak to us on um, uh, I am the Vine, Vine and Branches, Shaping Freedom and Equality in a Rootless World. Um, so do join us again. It's the same Zoom link. Um, so you should just be able to click on uh, the, the one which you use this week. 
but um, uh, again, we'd all applaud you uh, very loudly, I'm sure, Peter, uh, if we could. But uh, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you all next week at the same time. Thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, you know, do you do email me and I'll do my best to respond. That's very kind of you. Generously. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless. Yeah, bye, Jen. Isn't Chrissy? Yeah, Bye-bye, yeah. Peter. I'll email you, Peter. God bless. Good to see you. And then... Right, that's lovely. Okay.